We've reached week two of Murders at Carla Manor spoilers, and today we're going to be collecting some evidence. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Afrada with, and it's time for another daily dose of Murders at Carla Manor spoilers. So we kick off week two of spoiler season, and today we have some pretty interesting cards, especially some spicy and maybe pretty powerful collect evidence stuff, which means we should probably jump right into it, start talking new Murders at Carla Manor cards. Before we do, a couple of quick reminders. First, if you need any of these cards, you can pre-order them from our sponsor Card Kingdom over at cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. Second, to keep up on all the latest previews throughout the day, you should head on over to mtgpreviews.com. Anyway, let's talk murders at Karlov Manor. First up today, we got a new Golgari Mythic, an Urgent Necropathy. So four mana instant. Disrupt to one target artifact, one target creature, one target enchantment, one target planeswalker. So an absurd start, but... As an additional cost to cast this spell, collect Evidence X, where X is the total mana value of permanence this spell targets. Uh, so quick note here, because I saw a lot of confusion on this. So if you read this card closely, uh, is an additional cost to cast this spell, collect Evidence X, where X is the total mana value of permanence this spell targets. It makes it sound like you need to collect the exact right amount of evidence. So if you want to blow up a Shieldred, let's say, it sounds like you need to exile exactly four mana value worth of cards. But collect evidence by default means its mana value or greater so that's actually not true if you want to blow up a shieldred you can exile four mana value five mana value a hundred mana value if you want to and it's still gonna work so even though this card doesn't make that clear that's just like how the collect evidence mechanic works which makes it a little better than people think so the question is is this card good on one hand its effect is absolutely absurd right for four mana blowing up up to four things at instant speed is a ridiculously good deal it's basically a casualties of war for two less mana and instant speed except you don't get to blow up a land which i kind of wish this card could blow up a land but i see why they didn't since lands are zero mana value so you wouldn't have to exhale anything for the evidence it would just kind of be free uh, but i think that this card its ceiling is incredibly high the challenge is going to be can you actually get enough evidence in your graveyard consistently to blow up what you want so think of the dream scenario of this card you want to blow up a shieldred a wandering emperor a wedding announcement and for an artifact we'll go scrub I couldn't find like a better artifact. There's not a ton of artifacts that are seeing heavy play in standard. If you want to blow up these cards, you're going to need to exile 12 mana value worth of cards from your graveyard, at least, which is kind of a big ask, right? So you're going to have to be some sort of heavy self mill deck or have built your deck in a way where you have a plan for getting high mana value stuff into your graveyard, or this just isn't going to do what you need it to do. Of course, that's like kind of a hard scenario. There's easier scenarios. Let's say you're playing against mono red. You're your creature could be Monastery Swift Spear. Your enchantment could be Kimano Faces Kazan. Maybe you'll blow up the blood token from there and Epicure and Chandra Dress to kill. In this scenario, you need to blow up four things for much less collecting evidence. Five total mana value needs to be exiled because the blood token is going to be free because it's got no mana value. So this card, I think it's really strong, but it's going to be the kind of card that you only can play in certain decks. Uh, as I mentioned before, any of the artifact tokens, the trinkets we have in standard, uh, blood tokens, clue tokens, treasure tokens, those are kind of just free artifacts to blow up, which is a nice little bonus. Although they're also very low impact targets. So blowing up a blood token is probably not going to swing the game in your favor. But keep that in mind, if you are casting this card, you can and blow up one of those as your artifact without exiling any more from the graveyard so it's kind of just a free bonus so where can this card work so my first thought was okay we have golgari midrange in standard can i just jam this in golgari midrange and i think my current conclusion is not without rebuilding the deck like current golgari midrange the only card that actively fills the graveyard is blossoming tortoise even that's milling like three cards and if it sticks maybe three more the next turn that's just not enough graveyard filling for this to really be able to be powered up in turn on consistently one of the most frustrating removal spells are removal spells that are not always removal spells when you need a removal spell and especially in a standard where 
people are playing graveyard trespasser people are sideboarding in graveyard hate there's gonna be times when you really need this to kill something and it's just not gonna get the job done on the other hand if you're a deck that's built around this effect maybe you're the infamous urborg lorgoif self mill deck uh, then this card is gonna very easily be turned on and be able to blow up whatever you want the problem there is if you're playing like an urborg lorgoif deck you really want your cards in the graveyard or do you really want to exile several creatures to turn on a removal spell when those creatures are growing your Ur Borg Lorgoifs and Souls of the Lost and Cruel Somnophages. So there's a lot of tension there, right? Unlike Delve, you actually have to exile real cards. You can't just exile a bunch of Lanjing on the graveyard to collect evidence outside of just aggressively self-milling. There are some tricks to turning this on. So there's some mechanics that work really well with this. Like in standard right now, we have Channel, which just lets you discard cards like Greater Tanuki, six mana value. You can discard it for three to ramp, and then it gets in the graveyard, and then you can exile it to your Urgent Necropolis for collect evidence of six which is a pretty big number once you get to older formats the super popular land cyclers like generous ant lauren revealed work really well with this you just cycle them get your land get it in the graveyard have a bunch of evidence to collect so there are ways that you can really power this up also worth mentioning the ink commander i think this might just be generically good so it's still going to be high risk because there is a chance of course that someone has a bajuka bog and hits you with a bajuka bog and you lose your graveyard and it doesn't do anything but i think at a minimum in commander this is all star and self mill graveyard decks madrotha sadisi a uh, new staple there i would play it every single time in a deck that's looking to fill the graveyard because its effect is so good and in commander you're probably going to have all four targets well at least three maybe not a planeswalker but you're going to at least have three good targets on the battlefield most of the time uh, so this card is absurd in self mill commander decks but i think in commander it might be good enough just to play in a generic deck like maybe you're playing lathral elves or chatterfing squirrels i think enough stuff just dies and trades off and ends up in the graveyard in commander that i would probably still just run this in one of my removal slots because blowing up up to four things at instant speed is just such a ridiculous deal so urgent necropathy the card's kind of ridiculous it's just another one of those cards that's only ridiculous in certain decks or if you build around it so i think this card will see play but to see play uh, i think it's going to require rebuilding like golgari midrange in standard or just playing in specific self mill style archetypes we also got another collect evidence card in deadly cover-up and this one i think is actually pretty good so deadly cover-up five mana destroy all creatures but you can also collect evidence of six if you collect evidence of six you get to exhale a card from an opponent's graveyard then search its owner's graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with the same name exile them the player shuffles and draws a card for each card exiled from their hand this way so deadly cover up compared to urgent necropathy the thing i think that makes this card so much better is it's always going to do its job right it's always a five mana wrath and then if you need it to be you can also collect evidence to get more value out of it so that's a big big upside compared to urgent necropathy which if you can't collect evidence just does literally nothing so deadly cover up if you collect evidence it's essentially a five mana wrath with an extra peak tacked on also worth mentioning and there's a little confusion around this so the original spoiler of deadly cover up came in French the French version does not exclude basic lands if you look at extirpate itself it's choose a card in a graveyard other than basic lands deadly cover up apparently doesn't have this restriction which means you can maybe wreck a monocolor deck if you somehow get an island in the graveyard against merfolk you just get all their islands they won't make a land drop the rest of the game or against mono red you can kind of do the same thing also just like hilarious if you run into like rat colony or persistent petition or this is the destroyer of meme decks where it gets rid of all of your opponent's copies of their you can play any number of these in your deck cards so as far as standard is concerned we have a million wraths in standard the most wraths i think we've ever had in standard in magic's history right now many of them are very good but deadly cover-up is unique because it's the only real black wrath there is path to peril which technically is black but if you want a wrath with it you need white mana too so it's really an orzov wrath so this lets this card serve a purpose right like if you're a white deck you have infinite wrath options but what if you're golgari or ractos of some type you don't really have access to a wrath unless you're going to try to splash into white so deadly cover-up gives you this card and then you get the extra upside from collecting evidence so i think deadly cover-up 
will have a purpose in standard i think it will see play in standard even in the huge sea of wrath we have right now in commander i don't think it's really designed for commander like you can play it in commander if you want to it's still a five mana wrath but the collect evidence extirpate mode not really that exciting in a singleton format where people are only playing one copy of each card anyway we also got a new case in case of the neglected feast so one mana white case first mode is whenever a creature etb is under your control you gain a life to salve it you gotta gain five or more life in a turn and then once it's salved you can sacrifice it and give creatures in your graveyard the ability you can cast this card from your graveyard until end of turn so case of neglected feast this card's kind of wild so it's like an enchantment soul warden effect it's essentially a soul sister and it probably legitimately is good in soul sisters uh so it's like a soul warden effect and then once you salve it you basically get a past in flames for creatures which is a pretty powerful effect right as things trade off throughout the game or maybe you're doing some self milling or whatever eventually you're going to be able to cash this in to just recast a bunch of stuff from your graveyard and remember you get to keep the first mode anyway so it's not like you have to sacrifice this right away you can sacrifice it it will once it's solved but you can just leave it sit on the battlefield and work like a soul warden if you wanted to so first thought for this card is uh, this might actually make life gain into a thing in standard we're so close with lunark veterans and lsl cores and amelia in Voice of the Blessed and Resplendent Angel to having an actual life gain deck in standard, Case of the Neglected Feast might actually be the card that makes this possible. Not only does it give another soul sister and one that doesn't die to removal, uh, but it gives a way to get back all your creatures from the graveyard, which really synergizes with the Explore on Amalia, which is really good at dumping stuff in the graveyard. It's so good with Amalia that it could actually show up in the Pioneer decks. It's really competing with Return to the Ranks. If you haven't seen this, like Amalia combo in Pioneer, one of the hottest decks in the format right now you just play something that gains your life into wild growth walker into amelia you go infinite blow up the board with amelia you get this huge creature and then leave like a return to the ranks on the top of your deck so you're able to recast everything in your graveyard to set up the combo again if you need to it might be the case of neglected feast is just better return to the ranks i guess you got a little bit of a weird timing restriction so one of the tricks of the deck is you with amelia as you're exploring you just explore until you find return to the ranks and you leave that on top and then after you blow up your board you know the next turn you can reanimate your combo and go again if you need to case of neglected feast gonna be worse at that in specific on the other hand case of neglected feast is much better in your hand you can actually just run this out on turn one and it enables the combo by giving you an etb gain life effect on the battlefield and then as you combo it's going to solve the case and then if you have it on the battlefield pre-combo it essentially does everything return to the ranks does i think this card will also show up a lot on arena where arena players love their life gain decks there's nothing arena players love more than a johnny pride mate voice of the blessed trellis Sara. and this is a really natural fit in any sort of like life gain soul sisters deck you get the soul sisters effect it's a way to protect against a wrath once you solve the case it also worth mentioning that it could be possible to play this in non soul sister style decks so there's certain cards in standard that'll solve this case all by themselves so remember when a creature etbs you always gain one which means we need a creature that gains at least four life when it etbs and that creature will solve the case so like a tranquil frillback or obstinate bayloth or blossoming prancer or twain of industry or the backup from boombringer valkyrie will theoretically just solve this case all at once so i don't know if it will actually be realistic but i could see some sort of like weird graveyard self mill mid-range deck that isn't playing this as a soul sister but it's playing it just to salve it and then get the past in flames for your creatures where you can recast your graveyard uh, the obvious use of course is going to be the soul sister deck but i think it's possible that it could see playing a deck that's really trying to use it as like this strange reanimation effect as far as commander is concerned I think this is worth it in basically any life gain deck like in a life gain deck this card does exactly what you want right it comes down early gains your life as creatures enter the battlefield soul warden i think is actually like super underrated in commander no one bothers to kill it and it gains like 20 life or something and it wears equipment and all that stuff so this is like a weird soul warden and then eventually it's going to give you protection from a wrath sure you got to spend mana to like recast all your stuff but it's a nice bit of protection if something important dies so if you're playing like frodo and zam or will or bill or Laura or Carla or Linden, I think this card is more than good enough to make the cut. So case of neglected feast 
has a look of a card that actually might be good in Soul Sisters. I know I have a good in Soul Sisters card every single set, but I think this one might actually be the one. I think I say that every set too, but I think this one might actually be the one that finally makes Soul Sisters a thing again. We also got Forensic Engineer, which I think might be one of the strongest cards from the set so far. So three mana two three, Vidalkin Artificer Detective. It says when every cast an artifact spell, investigate. So you make a clue token, no research no once per turn any of those shenanigans and then activated abilities of artifacts you control cost one last to activate the effect can't reduce it to one uh, to less than one mana so essentially forensic engineer you cast an artifact you get a clue and your clues sack for one mana rather than two mana that is a really strong source of card advantage so this is kind of like a weird videlkin archmage is this repeatable source of card advantage as you cast artifact spells but it's also kind of like a sigh is this three drop that's just going to a ton of artifacts to the battlefield i know psy makes creatures and thopters forensic engineer not making creatures but still if you just care about having a mass of artifacts on the battlefield this card is going to get it done so first off in standard i think this is just a good clue card even if you're not really playing a ton of artifacts maybe you're just playing a few but you're playing like elquist and novus inspectors and ezrims the ability to sack your clues for one mana less allows you to have this huge card advantage turn right where you're able to like play forensic engineer have some mana available and just immediately your clack a few clues to refill your hand so just that might be good enough of course if you're playing commander this goes in any clue deck of all time like in commander you're going to be playing mana rocks most likely you're going to naturally have artifacts in your deck so it's going to make some number of clue tokens and more importantly if you're making a ton of like lana's clues or eloise clues this just actually lets you sacrifice them at a discount to get card advantage out of them we've also seen straight up artifact decks in standard like we've seen the blue white fabrication foundry spring loaded saw blade thousand moon smithy deck kind of show up in that deck forensic engineers a pretty sweet source of card advantage unfortunately it's not of artifact itself but you're playing so many artifacts so this is going to make a lot of clues and a lot of artifacts to the battlefield that you can use for crafting purposes you can use them for fabrication founder you can grow your thousand moon smithy tokens so there's a ton of synergies there also if you want to go really deep and like against the odd style encroaching lycosense still in standard just makes everything of yours into an artifact so all of your spells are going to trigger forensic engineer also in Commander, there's some decks where you just like want a ton of artifacts on the battlefield. So like Urza, for example, really just wants as many artifacts as possible. It doesn't really care what those artifacts are because you can tap them all for mana. Forensic Engineer, perfect in a deck like that or a deck like Emery. Plus it's powering up your Blink Mother and it's powering up your Mycosynth Golem. There's even infinite combos with this card. This is more the non-clue part of the card, but the activated ability cost reduction means that like Basalt Monolith just makes infinite mana. You tap it for three untap it for two thanks to forensic engineer do it again do it again do it again infinite colors mana i know everyone's saying oh you broke basalt monolith but still like if you're playing commander and you're playing forensic engineer maybe basalt monolith is in one of your mana rock slots just because of this backdoor plan and going infinite also can work with sword of the pair runes and something that taps for a bunch of mana if you have a creature that taps for at least three mana you can put the sword on it tap it for three untap it thanks to forensic engineer for just two mana do it again do it again infinite mana uh, I think there could also be maybe a home for this in like the Simit Cookie deck in standard. This deck hasn't fully taken off yet, but there's a lot of pieces for like a Simic Artifact Aggro deck with Tough Cookie and Surge Ginger and Thran Power Suit, even Reality Ice. Forensic Engineer seems like a nice option, if not in the main deck. The only drawback is it's not an artifact itself, which is a little bit of a non bill But worst case, this feels like a really strong sideboard card in Simic Cookies that you bring in in the slower, grindier matchups. You play it. You play a couple artifacts, get a couple clues, some card advantage to keep up in the grindy format. So Forensic Engineer, this card's like legitimately great. I think this card has potential in standard. I think it could even see play back to like Pioneer and Modern in some decks. And it seems like a staple in any sort of artifact or clue deck in Commander. Plus you get the infinite combo potential. Next up, we got a new Mythic Sphinx Detective in Conspiracy Unraveler. And this card is kind of wild. So... 7 mana 6 6 flyer it says you can collect evidence 10 rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast so as long as you can exile at least 10 mana value spells from your graveyard you get to cast 
your cards for free. This is kind of like a weird omniscience. It's an omniscience that's gonna run out eventually because it's gonna be impossible, right? To just like always have 10 mana value worth of spells in your graveyard to cast your entire deck. But you might be able to use Conspiracy Unraveler to cast enough spells to win the game. So I think this is mostly a reanimation target. So it's seven mana. It's really a lot to cast naturally. The good news is reanimation decks tend to fill the graveyard. So imagine in standard you're playing like Breach the Multiverse. What does Breach the Multiverse do? It mills each player for 10, then lets you reanimate. So if you can do this and hit the Sphinx, not only are you going to get the Sphinx, but you're going to have a ton of mana value of stuff in the graveyard that then you can use to cast more spells, maybe another Breach the Multiverse, and keep the fun going until you win the game. Uh, so that's one possibility. Also works in kind of any reanimation deck. Like if you're prying your reanimator deck, you're filling your graveyard that's naturally going to fit with collecting evidence. So I think that's probably the best home for Conspiracy and Raveler. The other thing you can do with this card, which is hilarious, is just try to chain together really expensive spells that draw cards. So imagine a deck that's full of Genesis Ultimatums, Cruel Ultimatums, Inspired Ultimatums. You get down your Sphinx, you exile 10 mana value worth of cards, you cast an Inspired Ultimatum, you gain 5 life, hit something for 5, draw 5 cards, and now you have a 7 mana value card in your graveyard. That gets you most of the way to casting something else for free with Conspiracy Unraveler. So you exile some cards, cast a Genesis Ultimatum ultimatum, cast a cruel ultimatum, and just keep churning through your deck. Uh, Genesis ultimatum, probably the weakest of the bunch, because it does go to exile at the end, uh, so you gotta keep that in mind. Some big spells, like expropriate Genesis ultimatum, do go to exile, but as long as you can get around that, there is a way you can just keep chaining these spells together. There's also probably some, like, combo mill potential, where you, like, get down Conspiracy and Raveler, you use it to cast maybe a Jace for free, and then Jace mills you for 15 cards, which fills your graveyard for Conspiracy and Raveler, to cast more spells for free. Keep doing that to churn through your deck until you win with, I don't know, a lab man or something. Also worth mentioning, Conspiracy Unraveler, pretty cute with split cards. So when it comes to split cards like Breaking Entering, the mana value is the combined mana value of the two halves. So even though Breaking and Entering is a two mana value card and a six mana value card, as far as Conspiracy Unraveler is concerned, it's an eight mana value card. So you can like cast the Breaking side to mill yourself a bunch to set up all your shenanigans and then be able to exile it for eight mana value towards collecting evidence which is pretty powerful i could see this showing up in like there's this weird historic deck that uses scholar of the lost troves to try to reanimate it and like get an omniscience and combo off and win the game conspiracy and raveler seems like a natural fit there so this card to me just seems super fun i think there's uses in 60 card formats and in commander if you're playing a bunch of big spells like yeah maybe you only get to cast two things for free or three things for free until you run out of evidence but still like that's kind of wild right even if this is like i cast my seven mana six six and i cast one other big spell for free that's already like an absurd turn that's probably going to win you the game so we'll see where it ends up it might be more of like an against the odds card than a true staple or maybe a reanimation staple but this is one of the sweetest designs i think that we've seen from the set so far speaking of not quite as sweet designs we also got lamplight phoenix which i think is honestly pretty bad so three minute three three flying okay fine start when it dies you may exile it collect evidence for if you do return lamplight phoenix to the battlefield tapped so we've seen phoenixes be really good in the past like arclight phoenix is probably the best example of this our constructed staple phoenix but lamplight phoenix is kind of missing everything that makes a phoenix good so a three minute three three fire that's nothing to scoff at that's not horrible but what you really want with a card like this first you want it to come back from your graveyard for free the power of arc light phoenix is you never have to cast it you just faithless Woody in the graveyard mill it in the graveyard it comes back for free lamplight phoenix it's got to die for you to get it back from your exile, I guess, if you can collect evidence, uh, which means you gotta get on the battlefield once. So you're always gonna have to spend that first three mana to get it on the battlefield. The other thing it's really missing is it doesn't have haste. Actually, it's the opposite of haste. Arclight Phoenix just comes back with haste. Lamplight Phoenix comes back tapped. It's like super slow, the opposite of haste, whatever that is. The bigger problem for this card, even with these issues, I could see it being like a fine standard card, but the bigger problem is so much popular removal just exile 
Trials and Standard Sunfall, Leyline Binding, Anoint with Afflictions, really popular now, Wandering Emperor. So this only is going to be recursive if it dies, and there's just so much removal in the format that's going to exile it that it's hard for me to imagine Lamplight Phoenix actually taking off, although there might be a way to combo with this card. I was trying to figure it out. So like Lamplight Phoenix, to get it back, you need to collect Evidence 4. What if we have like Altar of Dementia, which can sack a creature to mill equal to the creature's power? So we sack like, like Phoenix, we mill three cards, hopefully we hit enough mana value to get it back immediately, and then we can sack it to Altar of Dementia again, mill three more cards, hopefully mill enough big stuff to do it again. And if we can do this and add like a Blood Artist to the mix, or maybe a Thassa's Oracle after we mill our entire deck, we could just combo off and win the game. There is a little bit of risk here. Like if we're not starting with a full graveyard and our cards are not super expensive, we're probably going to have Altar of Dementia where we don't mill enough evidence to get Lamplight Phoenix back and we fizzle. So that's a concern. You'd have to build your deck in a way to make sure you're always milling those big spells to support it or starting with a full graveyard. But maybe this is actually just like a weird aristocrat style combo card rather than a value we are clay phoenix card so lamp Light phoenix pretty skeptical but there could be some sweet combos with it we also got one of the most fun cards from this set an outrageous robbery so outrageous robbery double black and x target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library face down. You can look in and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled and cast those spells as if your mana was mana of any color. So outrageous robbery. It's kind of like Gonti you a whole bunch of times, Siphon Insight you a whole bunch of times. If you can dump a bunch of mana into this, you just get to draw a huge chunk of your opponent's deck. And since it says play, you can actually play the lands along with casting the spells. So this is a card that a year or two ago, I would think, okay, this is probably like a funny commander card, maybe an against the odds card. But Siphon Insight has actually proven to be really good. Traditionally, the problem with cards that let you play cards from your opponent's deck is you're like, okay, my deck is built to synergize with my deck so my opponent's card is probably not going to be very good for me because they're built to synergize with their deck but remember it's 2024 no one really plays bad cards it's not like you're going to hit your opponent and get a bunch of nothingness because everyone's playing good cards especially in our current standard which is just this like mid-rangey good stuff slug fest so i imagine this card could actually be really good in some sort of control deck that wants to leave up its mana anyway you just leave up your counters leave up your removal if you don't need to do it you just outrageous robbery for all your mana on your opponent's end step steal a ton of their cards and set yourself up to win the game so I actually think this card is probably not just going to be fun but I actually think it could be competitive another comparison is like a twist on Villainous Wealth obviously Villainous Wealth lets you cast all the stuff you hit for free which is really powerful but Outrageous Robbery it's cheaper it's an instant and it lets you store up the cards like if you hit a counter with Villainous Wealth it does nothing with Outrageous Robbery it's actually great and being an instant is a huge deal a Villainous Wealth just came to Arena for the first time in Konzatark here or whatever, tried to build a deck around it, and it turns out tapping out for big sorceries, kind of tricky. Like, it's pretty easy for your opponent to just let you do it and then counter spell it. Being an instant is going to make it so much easier to actually get Outrageous Robbery to resolve compared to Villainous Wealth. I've seen some people be like, okay, well, we have cards like Silver Scrutiny in Standard, no one plays it. Pull from Tomorrow, that was a card that no one really played. Uh, why would anyone play Outrageous Robbery? And I think the answer is that it works really well in a world with Shield Rid. So, this is a draw a million cards like Silver Scrutiny, and Silver Scrutiny is a really good card. The problem is that like 50% of decks almost, maybe it's 30 something now, are playing Shieldred, and Shieldred is so punishing to these big card draw effects. Outrageous Robbery doesn't care. It gives you that same effect, this mass card advantage engine, but it isn't going to kill you if your opponent has a Shieldred out, or get stuck in your hand if your opponent has Shieldred out. So I actually think this could be a pretty solid card in the black mid-range decks, and some of the big mana, like big score ramp style decks in control style decks in our standard format plus it's gonna see play in prosper i think this is the first time i've said that this spoiler season i've been good i've been good i know everything works in prosper but really along with play from exile effects any sort of commander deck that is about thieving on your opponent's stuff like gonti or xanathar or zevalor this is going to be a great addition there it's especially hilarious with zevalor because it targets one opponent so for two additional mana you can copy it and steal from each of your opponent's deck this is probably like the best card in a zevalor deck honestly so outrageous robbery 
it just seems super fun. I love cards that steal from your opponent's deck. And these cards, just the way magic has evolved recently, have actually went from like meme against the odds commander cards to somewhat competitive cards. So I actually have some high hopes that Outrageous Robbery might actually be pretty good. We also got a new white two drop in Door Keeper Thrall. So two mana, one, two, flash flying, artifacts and creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. Thanks, Watsy. Watsy prints a Pandermonic on every set. They tempt me into building the Pandermonic on deck, and then they have to print Doorkeeper Thrall to just ruin my dreams. Really, though, I mean, we've seen similar effects, right? Uh, Hushbringer, Strict Proctor, these two drops that shut down triggered abilities, things entering the battlefield. I think that Doorkeeper Thrall might be the best of them, though, for one big reason, which is it has Flash. So we've seen this with Opposition Agent. Opposition Agent without Flash, not that good of a card, right? Because your opponent's know the effect is out there so they're just like all right i'm not gonna tutor until it dies but because opposition agent has flash you're almost guaranteed to get your opponent with it once they cast their tutor you flash in you get them then they're gonna stop tutoring but you get them that one time doorkeeper thrill is gonna do the same thing i guess we kind of had like a worse version of it in hushwing grift uh but hushwing grift at three mana is just so much harder to play it two man i think doorkeeper thrill is maybe the new best version of this effect. It shuts down creatures and artifacts. It's only two mana and flash lets you sneak in and get your opponent by surprise. So obviously this is a hoser for the Delaney, Elish Norn style decks in standard. But if you look at standard, this card might actually just be good. Like, if you look at the most played creatures in the format, many of them, Tishana's Tidebinder, Trumpeting Carnosaur, Archangel or at Deep Cavern, Atroxa, they all have ETB triggers. Yes, it's going to die to cut down. Yes, it's going to die to play with fire. But really, if your opponent's tapping out for a Carnosaur or Atroxa, there's a pretty good chance you can flash this in. And yeah, you're still going to have to deal with the creature eventually, but at least Fizzle has entered the battlefield trigger. There's also shenanigans you can do by stifling your own negative ETB triggers. Uh, we've never really seen this plan take off and be competitive, but the idea of like, I play my doorkeeper throw and then play my Uro and it sticks around forever. That could be something you could do in Timeless or uh, I play a leveler and it's not going to exile my entire library and I get this huge undercosted creature. More competitively though, this could actually see modern play like hitting on artifacts is relevant there. That shuts down the one rings protection, for example. And that's one of the ways these grindy decks stay alive against aggro is they just play the one ring, use that one extra turn and the three extra cards to stabilize. Doorkeeper throw, sure your opponent's going to get to draw the cards with the one ring, but even just stifling the protection trigger might let you swing back in and win the game the next turn. Shuts down Bowmaster's ETB trigger, uh, shuts down Solitudes and Grief, so I could show it and see it showing up in sideboards and maybe some sort of like death and taxes deck if that becomes a thing again. In Commander, you're going to make people really not like you because you're hitting on their Moldrifters and so forth. But at least in like CDH that shuts down the Thassa's Oracle Kill. So if you don't mind taking a little heat and really annoying the table, it is a very powerful effect in Commander as well. So Doorkeeper Throw, we've seen similar versions of this effect in the past. The Hushwing Griffs, the Hushbringers, the Torpor Orbs. I think this is the best version. If you want a Torpor Orb that's on a body, the fact that this one is only two mana and it has flash so you can get someone by surprise actually makes it really good. Next up, we have Leyline of the Guild Pack, a new Leyline. So mana cost, <laughs> hybrid Selesnia, hybrid Simic, hybrid Golgari, hybrid Gruul. So four total mana, you pay mono green or a bunch of mixes of colors. Uh, it says if it's in your opening end, you can begin the game with it on the battlefield, like every Leyline. Its effect is each non permanent you control is all colors and lands you control are every basic land type in addition to their other types. So Leyline of the Guild Pack, <laughs> What does this card even do? This card is hilarious, and it's so sweet to see another ley line, but I'm not sure its effect does enough to be playable. So essentially, you get a Prismatic Omen, and then you get a Everything's a Sphinx of the Guild Pack, essentially. All of your non-land permanents are all colors. I think this card is certainly has uses, right? And it's going to do some really fun, funky against the odds things, and that makes me excited about it. I don't think it's, like, competitive in any way, but it can do some funny things. Like, if you're playing a five color deck you could theoretically like turn on Velikat the Bull and Pinnacle and turn on Amiria the Sky Ruin 
you can have both of these effects that care about very different basic land types going at the same time which actually seems kind of strong so there's some weird janky synergies the problem with going all in on this plan though is if your opponent just stops the ley line of the guild pack then your deck is going to be a mess and none of it's going to do anything but the games where it works are going to be really funny i did want to mention so one weird aspect of this card when i first saw it i was like wow this is going to be so sweet in decks that care about multicolor stuff like jensen Carthalion. whenever you cast a multicolor spell you scry one then if it's all colors create a 4-4 angel with flying and vigilance so you play the ley line of the guild pack you play your jensen every spell is just like doing everything but that's not really how it works if you read the ley line closely it says each non-land permanent you control is all colors so your cards are not going to be all colors until they're on the battlefield so this isn't going to work with any multicolor spell synergies cloven casting jensen Carthalion, generous ferris rock rig none of that stuff this really doesn't do anything other than fix your mana i guess so keep that in mind as you're looking at synergies for this card your spells are still going to be their natural colors but then once the spell gets on the battlefield if it's a permanent spell uh, then it will be all colors the color shifting ability can <laughs> do some jakey things you kind of got that same problem we were talking about before though so like your Torbrand adds damage to your red sources but all your things will be red so it just adds damage to any of your sources bad moon pumps black creatures but Torbrand will technically be a black creature so it'll pump your Torbrand. deep channel mentor makes blue creatures you control unblockable but your Torbrand will actually be a blue creature so it'll be unblockable and be pung being pumped by the bad moon and your Torbrand will be adding damage to your deep channel mentor which is also a red creature which is being pumped by the blood moon so that's the kind of stuff you can do with this card although the same issue comes down which is you set all this up and it's like so sweet if you have the ley line of the guild pack but if your opponent just blows it up then you have a deep channel manter that's a six mana two to a tor brand that's not doing anything a bad moon that's not pumping anything so it's going to be very very high risk if you decide to build around this you're going to have to make sure that you can have a way to recur it have a way to protect it it'll do really funny super sweet weird things on the battlefield but you got to be able to keep it on the battlefield for it to work probably the most competitive use of this is just playing Playing it with Nykthos and Mono Green Devotion, technically it has four green mana symbols. So there's ways with like Sunken Citadel that you could play like two of these on turn zero. Sunken Citadel, which taps for two for Nykthos on turn one, Nykthos on turn two, and you just have like eight mana on turn two and go off. So there's probably some devotion shenanigans that abuse just the fact it has so many green mana symbols. The same is also kind of true of like Bloom Tender or Fabro Elder, just cares about the number of colors that you control. Uh, in Leyline line is all five colors by itself and it's turning all your other things into all five colors so your bloom tender is always going to tap for five your favor is always going to tap for five there's also just like straight up against the odds kills happily ever after once you have all five colors worth of permanence ley is going to do that all by itself coalition victory it's banned unfortunately in commander but you need to have a land of every basic land type and a creature of each color ley line of the guild pack just like straight up lets you win the game coalition victory ley line of the guild pack as long as you have any creature creature on the battlefield you'll win the game on the spot which is kind of hilarious I kind of wish they would just unban coalition victory in commander but maybe it'd be too OP now that we have ley line of the guild pack I do think this card's going to be really overrated though so here's my take on this card the TLDR the card does really fun janky weird things I'm going to build a bunch of decks around it. They're going to be horrible. We're going to get blown out repeatedly, but when they work, they're going to be really, really sweet. What this card is not worth it as, though, is like a Chromatic Lantern. Don't just play this card in your five-color deck to be like, oh, but fixing. My mana it taps for all colors. Life is so good now. No, no, no. Don't do that. It's not worth a card. Like, if you really want to do that, at least play Chromatic Lantern, since Chromatic Lantern at least ramps you and does something. Uh, and even Chromatic Lantern, my belief is, mana bases are so good now that unless you're playing a budget deck and you really need the fixing of chromatic lantern if you're playing an optimal deck you don't actually really even need chromatic lanterns fixing because your lands are just so good with fetch lands and triumphs and shock lands that you don't even need it you don't need your lands to tap for all colors so please 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 don't be like i'm just gonna jam this in my five color deck for fixing play chromatic lantern instead or better yet don't play any of them and just build a good mana base uh, there is one commander deck where i think this card is is legit exciting which is jared carthalion so jared carthalion five mana 
Commander Planeswalker. Plus when it makes a copy that's all colors, negative three, choose two colors for each of them, put a number of plus one, plus one counters on them equal to its colors, and then negative six, return all multicolor cards from your graveyard to your hand. Blah, 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 blah. It doesn't actually work because Leyline of the Guild Pack cares about permanents you control, cards in your graveyard, not permanents you control. The big deal here though is that negative three ability is going to put five plus one, plus one counters on two creatures, your best two creatures. You could be putting it on infect creatures if you wanted to double strike creatures voltron threats so i think there's probably something here with jared in leyline of the guild pack otherwise i think this is just like so flavorful and sweet but like the ultimate against the odds card it's a card that just does so many weird things i don't think those things are like probably gonna be that great at winning games just because the way you gotta build your deck to truly embrace leyline's power is gonna be in a way where if you don't have Leyline, you're gonna be playing probably the worst deck in existence. But the games where you do have Leyline, you're gonna do things that no one has ever done before in the history of Magic, and that really makes me love the card. In the world of lower rarity cards, just one worth mentioning individually today, in Cease Desist. So Cease and Desist, the front side, two mana, one in a Golgari hybrid instant. Exile up to two target cards from a single graveyard. Target player gains two life and draws a card. And then the backside, six total mana with two Selesnia hybrid. Destroy all artifacts and enchantments. So if you think about this card, it's essentially like a more expensive Fracturing Gust, Cleansing Nova, six mana to blow up all artifacts and enchantments. It's like one or maybe two more than you really want to pay. But I think that the C side of this card really helps make up for it. If you think about what that side does, I know it reads like Graveyard Height, and it is kind of Graveyard 8. But the way I view that is it essentially means you can just cycle this card for two mana and even get to gain two life. So even if you're not in a Graveyard matchup, a like Fracturing Gust style effect that when you don't don't need it you can cycle away seems like a pretty powerful option again this is going to be a very meta dependent card it's going to depend on how many artifact and enchantment decks are running around in the format is it even important to be able to blow up those types but if it is i think this card's actually at least a solid sideboard option where you get graveyard hate and artifact and enchantment hate and the fact that that seaside essentially lets it cycle for two mana might even make it a main deck option at least in best of one if we end up in a meta where blowing up artifacts and enchantments are important also could be a fine commander card like cycle for two and be able to blow up all artifacts and enchantments uh, it is symmetrical so that means you're going to be blowing up your artifacts and enchantments but if you don't care about that and you're in the colors i could definitely see running this card hard hitting question the new cheapest bite spell ever one mana target creature you control deals damage equal to his power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control so this is just as cheap as biting gets that could be relevant for constructed soul search a new two mana thought see his opponent reveals their hand you take a non-land card you exile it which is a nice little upgrade in a world of recursive threats plus if the card is super cheap you can make it a spirit token uh, these cards the two mana thought sees effects they're usually not busted but they often do show up in sideboards in standard so i think soul surge with its upsides of exiling the card maybe even making a spirit token is enough that this could have a role in standard otherwise there's just a ton of draft jaffed up today so many lower rarity cards you can check them all out over on mtdpreviews.com anyway that brings us to the end of daily spoilers number two for the day so let me know what you think we got so many sweet cards today what's your favorite one from the set what are you hyped about what do you think of the new ley line what shenanigans can you do with it how good is this fix let me know in the comments thanks for watching everyone i hope you enjoyed it and i'll be back tomorrow with even more spoilers so until then have an amazing night and I will talk to you soon. Looking for even more magic? Well, you can check out yesterday's spoiler video here, or maybe the Against the Odds, where we tried to combo off with Intruder Alarm and Timeless.